It's seven o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. Our top stories. I have lost my best friend. Heartbroken family and friends pay tribute to a 23-year-old man stabbed to death in a Birmingham nightclub. Two people are still being questioned over the death of beautician Ellie Edwards, killed during a shooting at a pub in Liverpool. America's storm of a lifetime. 65 people are now known to have died, but it's feared that number will rise. A fresh round of strikes are underway this morning. Border guards are walking out at major airports and some train services are also hit. Data seen by Sky News suggests that over one million women caught up in a pension payments trap are living in debt. Sky News has been told that, chi that despite China's easing of COVID restrictions, hospitals are overwhelmed with the numbers of patients dying from the virus. A call for new sanctions on Iran. Labour says a crackdown is needed on those suppressing protests in the country. I'm here in Surrey as the National Trust warns that this year's extreme weather conditions could become the new norm unless measures are taken to tackle climate change. In sport, Marcus Rashford plays his part as Manchester United move to within a point of the top four in the Premier League. And joining me at 7.45 to review this morning's papers are the broadcasters and journalists Thomas Copeland and Badisha Mamata. Very good morning. Police have named the 23-year-old man stabbed to death on the dance floor of a nightclub in Birmingham. Cody Fisher, a semi-professional footballer, was attacked just before midnight on Boxing Day. Detectives are trying to identify a group of people suspected of carrying out the attack. In a statement, Cody's family said they have broken our hearts. Sky's Becky Johnson reports. Cody Fisher was a young footballer who was on a night out with friends when he was stabbed to death. He was on the dance floor in a nightclub in Birmingham when he was attacked. At his club, Stratford Town, the players and chairman are in shock. He's a talented footballer, but more importantly, he was a lovely person. He was just a lovely lad, he had a cheeky smile on his face, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. He, he didn't have a bad bone. He was such a good kid. Shouldn't have happened, should it? We get so close to these kids at this level. And they just need a chance, don't they? And then they they go out harmlessly and they don't come home. It's got to change, isn't it? It's got to change. Pictures from inside the Crane nightclub in Digbeth show a packed dance floor on Boxing Day night. It was as the evening was coming to an end that Cody was fatally stabbed. Staff described mayhem as people ran out of the club. Officers were called at quarter to midnight, but Cody was pronounced dead around half an hour later. There were hundreds of people in this nightclub and police say they want to speak to anyone who saw what happened or has footage on their mobile phones. Some people who are at the club have described seeing a group of young men who were looking for trouble. Other clubbers have criticised security checks at the event. Police say Cody was approached by a group of people and then stabbed, but no one knows why he was targeted. One of his family has paid tribute, saying they have broken our hearts. I've lost my best friend. My family and I are asking for privacy and respectfulness at this heartbreaking time. The nightclub say their thoughts are with the victim and his family and friends and add that they're working closely with West Midlands police. They've cancelled their event on New Year's Eve. The football clubs where Cody has played over the years have all been sharing their shock and sadness. This promising young footballer, now the latest innocent victim of senseless violence. Becky Johnson, Sky News, Birmingham. Meanwhile, two people are still being questioned in Merseyside over the death of 26-year-old Ellie Edwards in a pub on Christmas Eve. 
The beautician, who was having a night out with friends, is not believed to have been the target of the attack. A man who was injured in the attack remains in a critical condition in hospital. 65 people are now known to have died across North America in one of the continent's worst winter storms in decades. And for some areas, there's even more extreme weather on the way. Forecasters say flash floods are expected in the US Pacific Northwest and California. And some areas could see another 12 inches of snow with residents warned to stay at home. Over the weekend, an estimated 250,000 homes and businesses experienced blackouts, although power has been steadily restored. Almost 4,000 US flights were cancelled on Monday, with delays expected to continue over the coming days. US President Joe Biden has approved an emergency declaration in New York State, allowing federal support for areas such as Erie County and its main city of Buffalo. Our US correspondent James Matthews reports. In upstate New York, they're still testing the depth of this crisis. These are pictures from Buffalo, with streets eerily empty as the city waits for the snow to subside. There have been dozens of fatalities and the number is expected to rise. The clear-up is, in part, a casualty count. It is uh, painful uh, to find members of your community that are deceased, uh, those that are deceased uh, actually uh, on streets in our community who were trying to walk out during storm conditions, got disoriented and passed away out in the street. Tens of thousands of people remained without power for yet another day in New York State. President Biden pledged federal funds for affected areas as more snow was forecast. They have been out there talking to them personally about their experiences going into homes, uh, going into vehicles and then too many tragic times of finding people who did not survive the experience. And I want them to know that we know that is difficult work to do. And they're grieving inside, as we all are, for the families who are getting the horrible, heartbreaking news that their loved ones succumbed to the storm over the last day or two. Well, I want people to understand there's a lot of roads that are completely blocked right now, that have no access whatsoever. And people are trying to drive into on these roads or trying to get into these neighborhoods, and they can't. Please, please, you heard the mayor beg, I'm begging. Stay home. Also do so online. Travel chaos has continued through Christmas and beyond. This was the scene at San Diego Airport, where the baggage was going nowhere and neither were passengers. Cancelled flights have stranded thousands across the country. These are pictures from Buffalo, as the Buffalo Bills football team and staff dug out their vehicles. It provided one measure of snowfall delivered by the Arctic blast, though ultimately... The storm that straddled Christmas will be defined by its destruction and death. James Matthews, Sky News, in Washington. In other news, a new round of strikes gets underway this morning. Members of the TSSA union at Great Western Railway and West Midlands trains are staging 24-hour walkouts. And there's a new strike of UK border guards at major airports and some ports too. Even before today's border force strike, there was disruption at Lille at the French Eurostar station last night. Inbound London commuters were delayed for more than three hours, with many complaining of unmanned border force stations and long queues. The NHS says it is on track to eliminate hepatitis C in England by 2025. Health chiefs say this is thanks to a five-year contract for an antiviral drug and a dedicated find-and-treat campaign to drive down cases in vulnerable communities. Some hospitals in China are said to be overwhelmed by the numbers of people dying from COVID, and that's despite the country's recent easing of its tough restrictions. Well, Sky News has spoken to some of the doctors involved who paint a picture of chaos in some of the hospitals in the country. Uh, our Asia correspondent, Helen Ann Smith, joins us live now from Beijing. Hello to you, Helen Ann. Of course, uh, COVID restrictions have been lif lifted very quickly uh, in China for a population of 1.4 billion people. Explain to us what you're hearing in terms of the pressure that that's piling on the health service. 
Well, it's causing an immense amount of pressure on the health service and trying to figure out just how much and where is an incredibly difficult task in China because these things are really veiled in secrecy. Uh, there are simply not the official numbers being released anymore. Uh, daily case numbers are, are not being released. And death numbers, well, we're getting sort of one or two or three a day, but we're talking about a population where hundreds of millions of people are likely now infected. That's actually according to a, official leaks from government documents. So uh, the numbers of deaths that are officially being announced simply don't tally up with what is almost certainly happening. So uh, at Sky News, we've been reaching out to doctors and nurses and trying to speak to them and trying to get a picture of what is going on. And three of them have spoken to us, albeit on an anonymous basis. And the picture they paint is really of very chaotic scenes within the hospital. One doctor who's based in the northern city of Shenyan, he says that of the patients that he's caring for in the most uh, the most seriously ill patients in intensive care, roughly 50% of those patients are going on to die from the disease. He talks about uh, the emergency department being packed with people, being dozens of times, quote, dozens of times busier uh, than it would normally be. Uh, he talks as well about the ratio of patients to medical staff. Previously, it would have been about four or five patients to one doctor, now about 10 patients uh, per doctor. Uh, others speaking of ambulances, there's simply not being enough ambulances in, uh, around to ferry all the sick people to hospital. Another doctor spoke about the fact that almost all of the nurses have contracted COVID themselves, meaning there just aren't enough staff uh, on the ward to help people. People have been asked to work while they're sick. Uh, and others are doing days, multiple days of shifts in a row to try and deal with the pressure that those departments are under. So really painting a very difficult picture indeed. Remember, the COVID restrictions here were incredibly strict, really for the entire duration of the pandemic. And then they were very suddenly lifted about three weeks ago now. And the virus has simply ripped through the population here. As I said, we just don't know how many infections there are. But this is a very large population with low levels of natural immunity because that herd immunity just hasn't built up here. And the vaccinations here are less effective than Western vaccines. And then add on to that the uh, rates of the elderly who are fully vaccinated is lower than, than really uh, doctors say it should be. So uh, there are a lot of factors that mean that people are getting very sick here in China and, and seemingly they are dying. Uh, it just albeit we just don't know those uh, figures officially. Okay, Helen Ann, we appreciate your updates. Thank you. Now, Labour is calling for new sanctions against Iran for its brutal repression on people taking part in those protests in the country. It's now 100 days since the protests began and the party is calling for the government here to target indiv individuals and organisations with sanctions. Well, joining me now is our political correspondent, Mari Aurora. Good morning to you, Mari. Uh, what is it that Labour is calling for? Morning, Sally. Well, the Labour Party are calling for a very specific type of sanctions on individuals and organisations. So not sanctioning in the entire country, but sanctioning individuals and organisations that have links to or connections to uh, the oppression of Iranian citizens, notably protesters. Uh, we saw just over the weekend seven Brits arrested. They're dual uh, citizens, so they have dual Iranian citizenship as well. Now, they were arrested on Sunday by the Revolutionary Guard. We've also had uh, other uh, kind of acts of uh, resistance uh, just this week earlier. We had two female chess players, Iranian chess players, choosing to play, uh, not wearing their headscarves as well. And as you say, because this marks 100 days uh, for this protest, these are actually the, the, the largest protests we've seen in Iran since the revolution in 1979. So very, very significant. But also the Labour Party, they're calling for uh, these uh, sanctions, but they're also calling for the urgent uh, kind of getting going of the UN Human Rights Council's investigation into crimes committed by the Iranian regime as well. So they're calling for two things. Uh, and, and also David Lamy, he's spoken, he's given us a comment, and he said there's killings and oppression uh, by the Iranian regime against protesters is appalling. He said the Iranian regime needs to be held accountable for the crimes they've committed. But the issue here is sanctions are always quite politically delicate. Uh, sanctions 
are very much one diplomatic tool in the arsenal of diplomacy. They're not a silver bullet at all. And I think these types of sanctions, specifically targeting individuals and organisations, means that you're not punishing an entire population or an entire country uh, for the crimes or the actions of individuals and organisations, but also it avoids any kind of clashes with broader foreign policy as well. So they can be quite convenient in that way. Nonetheless, I think some people are always worried about how how much of a deterrent effect they're going to have and will they actually deter people from uh, acting in the same way in the future if it's not on a wider scale. So we'll just have to see. But no one believes that these types of sanctions are a kind of a cure for the issues in uh, Iran. But nonetheless, I think the Labour Party are hoping to put pressure on the government and therefore these sanctions could then put pressure on the Iranian regime as okay. well. Okay, Mari, for now, thanks very much. So staying on that story, it's 100 days into the Iranian protest. What is the situation in the country? Well, joining me now is Executive Director of Iranian and Kurdish women's rights organisation and women's rights activist, Diana Nami. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. 100 days of protests. They show no, no sign of ending, do they? What's the latest in terms of what you're hearing? Uh, uh, it is significant. It is uh, a very, very important. Iran, after the revolution in 1997, um, uh, in 1979, sorry, uh, we never had this. Uh, Length of the revolution to continue for 100 days. It is very, very important, and uh, it is giving hope to so many people and uh, to end a very brutal and dictatorship regime uh, in the in the in the world. I have to say. Now, in terms of what we know about what is happening inside the country, only only a small amount of information is getting out via social media or other means. It, it, it's potentially a glimpse of what is exact what, it, what is actually happening when it comes to the extent of the protests and the treatment of the protesters. What are you hearing about what's happening? Yes, uh, of course, uh, because of the uh, uh, internet. Uh, banning in Iran, so the news is not coming out as much as we want, but we can see and hear that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people has been in the street for this uh, 100 years, and there is, they say there is no go back at all, and we have to go until we uh, topple this regime, this uh, very uh, tyranny regime. And uh, uh, thousands of people has been in the street all this time, and it has it has you know like any revolution it has ups and downs. There there are days that the situation is a bit calmer, and there are days that more young people and more people are coming to the street, or they do uh, lots of uh, strikes, especially the uh, strike from uh, from uh, fabrics and uh, from. Uh, uh, factories, uh, it is very important. But during this 100 years, uh, 100 days, government has not been stopped. They try to oppress the, uh, the this demonstration and this revolution as much as they could. And they arrested more nearly 20,000 people so far. They arrested so many people that prisons are full and they turned many of the schools uh, to prison at the moment. They executed uh, more than, uh, uh, I have to say that they killed more than 500 people so far. And we can see every day the kidnapping of uh, young people and uh, they torture uh, them, they rape them, they kill them and they throw their body in the rivers or throw them in the mountains or in the streets of uh, places that people don't know them and it take uh, days for their family to identify their body. And in some cases, actually, even government empty their, uh, you know, take out their organs from their body and uh, they give uh, they give the body back to the family without their organs in that. They, this regime is so brutal. Uh, they killed so many children. And what can I say it's important, the continuation uh, of this demonstration, the continuation of the revolution, despite all this oppression, people 
in a uh, every day when uh, uh, you know in Iran we have got something we call a chela that means 40 days after the death uh, it is uh, uh, of any person it is a kind of memorial service again uh, for the uh, dead pe- pe- people and every chela e- after every 30, 40 days okay. people also coming to the street and they shouting against government they are calling for the government to to be uh, to topple and they are fighting to have the human rights women's rights equality uh, to stop all the discrimination to stop all this execution and this revolution uh, you know continue to have the slogan women's life freedom which is very important and become a slogan all over the world and this is very shiny about this Iranian revolution that women so far has been the uh, uh, the lead of this uh, uh, of this revolution and that has women has been and, and women's rights has been so much respected and accepted by people in Iran by men and by everyone which is very significant in my opinion. Okay, in light of all that, Diana, just very briefly, if I may, given the oppression uh, that protesters are under in the country, but also the ongoing protests that show no sign of ending, how do you see this ending? I think this protest has no ending. Uh, It started something that, as I say, it's no way to go back, but it's all the way to go forward. And uh, the slogan uh, now, people want uh, to turn down this regime. And I think it, it may delay uh, we, I am not saying that it's happened in this week or next week, but I am saying definitely it will happen in the next uh, uh, n- next few months, let's say, uh, which is very important in my opinion. It will, uh, you know, end. It will end this regime, and it will be the start of a renaissance, not just in Iran but in Middle East. And so just very, just very quickly to clarify, you think that the Iranian regime could be top, toppled in the next couple of months? It is what I am hoping. I am hoping it will be there less than a year, definitely. It is what I am hoping. Fascinating stuff. We really appreciate your insight, Diana. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Now, the National Trust is warning that extreme weather will become the new norm in the UK and it's putting plans in place to protect nature and wildlife. Well, Sky's Matthew Thompson is at Box Hill in Surrey, one of the National Trust's most popular estates. Good morning to you, Matthew. Very interesting, isn't it, that the National Trust is throwing their voice uh, behind the climate change cause. What are they saying? Very strongly so. Uh, This is part of the National Trust's annual review of weather and nature, and it comes, as you rightly say, with a pretty stark warning that their fears are that the extreme weather events of the last year, from record summer temperatures to freezing winters, could become the new norm and pose significant challenges for wildlife. The uh, summer, of course, that just went was the joint hottest on record. We saw record temperature of 40.3 degrees reached in July. And although it does seem slightly counterintuitive to be saying this from underneath an umbrella, much of the country, believe it or not, is still in drought because months of low rainfall have simply failed to replenish what was lost to the heat over the summer. That clearly has serious implications for a variety of wildlife. Wildfires devastated much of the country, particularly on National Trust land in places like the southwest of England. That has caused devastation to the habitats of a number of rare species of lizard, of snake, of butterfly, for example. The low rainfall has proven challenging for the breeding cycles of uh, rare species of toads, of bats, of butterflies, and all manner of other animals. Now, all is not entirely lost. The National Trust says that through its conservation work, it is able to mitigate some of the damage, for example, 
at their Holnacoat estate in Somerset, they reintroduced beavers. And beavers, amazingly, simply by their presence and the engineering works they construct, keep the water levels much higher than they would otherwise be. That therefore keeps uh, nearby woodland wet and lush uh, and better uh, maintained. But the point is, that is very much damage limitation. And the real fear from the National Trust is that the cycle of extreme weather events that we've seen in 2022 are a blue print really for what comes in the future and that potentially causes some serious uh, challenges for both nature for wildlife and for the national trust certainly does matthew we appreciate the update oh take care out there don't blow away we'll, we'll see you later go and, go and get a cup of tea take, thank you love. weather events <laughs> and with parts of the world experiencing extreme weather conditions, let's have a look at the impact of climate change on the planet. This is our climate dashboard, and the right half of the screen shows you how the UK's power is currently being produced. On the top left, you can see how much warmer the Earth is now than in 1880. That's when modern record keeping began. And finally, if you have a look in the bottom left, the total amount of CO2 emissions that's in millions of tonnes, and those are live data. Speaking of weather, let's have a look at how things are looking today. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It'll be unsettled this week with spells of wind and rain. Southern parts will be fairly mild, wet and windy at first today, as we've just seen, while the north will be mostly fine but chilly with a patchy frost and Shetland will be wet. Rain in the south will spread across many parts this morning with brighter skies and a scattering of showers following to Ireland, but Scotland will stay mostly dry and sunny. A very good morning. You're watching Sky News Breakfast, our top stories. The family and friends of 23-year-old Cody Fisher have paid tribute to him after he was named as the victim of a fatal knife attack in a Birmingham nightclub. Meanwhile, two people are still being questioned over the death of beautician Ellie Edwards, killed during a shooting at a pub in Liverpool. A call for new sanctions on Iran. Labour says a tougher crackdown is needed on those suppressing protests in the country. Now, another news. Many of the three million women caught up in a pensions trap are said to be struggling financially, with a third saying they are in debt. The women, born in the 50s, have been campaigning because they claim they were overlooked when the government increased the state pension age to 66, when they were expecting to claim a pension from the age of 60. Sky's Ash Nahorinag has the story. After over three decades working as a carer, Moira's health began to suffer. But getting her through it was knowing retirement at 60 was round the corner. Except what she and 3.8 million women born in the 50s weren't told was the state pension age had risen. With no time to prepare, she suddenly learned she had to work for six more years. It was devastating, absolutely devastating. Physical and mentally, it was really struggling, really struggling to work. And also, lots of my friends died at 60, so they never got their pension. So not only that, I'm thinking, am I ever going to see this pension? Because am I going to live to be 66? Nobody knows. After years of campaigning, last year the parliamentary ombudsman found these women should have been given more notice. For women like Moira, it could have made a huge difference to their lives. Data shared exclusively with Sky News found almost a third of women affected are in debt. 80% of those surveyed said they had suffered financial hardship by the delay in finding out the age of retirement had moved. And over 220,000 women affected have died without answers. Many of them Angela knew personally, and it's for them she continues to fight for answers. The government has never really engaged with us. Guy Opperman, the last pensions minister, said he last met with the WASPI campaign in 2016, um, which really is atrocious, given that we have lost so much through government incompetence. The Department for Work and Pensions says it prioritises supporting people to get the help they are entitled to and point to both the High Court and Court of Appeal judgments which support their actions on the issue. For a generation of women, their wait for compensation ticks on as they can't shake the feeling of injustice. Ashna Harinag, Sky News. 
Now, the National Trust is warning that this year's extreme weather conditions are set to become the norm, and it's worried about the impact that it's having on its estates and wildlife. Well, joining me now is Head of Nature Conservation at the National Trust, Ben McCarthy. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what sort of National Trust habitats and wildlife are un most under threat? Well, we're seeing the impacts of climate change uh, uh, impacting all of our habitats across our estate. Um, in England, Wales, Northern Ireland. So it doesn't matter if it's the uh, the grasslands uh, of southern England or the woodlands of uh, Northern Ireland or the peatlands of uh, Wales. The impacts are being seen uh, right across our estate, and they're having a real. Uh, they 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 put up a whole series of challenges for the wildlife that in our care. So, for example, we know that uh, some of the threatened natterjack toads, for example, in the in the ponds of Formby sand dunes, uh, are drying out, stopping the toads uh, being able to breed. Um, so, there's a whole gamut of kind of examples of of where the impacts are. Uh, are, are being seen um, right in front of our eyes. And it's a real challenge for us to uh, tackle the challenging weather events, which we know are only going to get worse with uh, the onset of climate change. Uh, and what measures is the National Trust taking to try to protect some of these species and, and habitats that are being affected? Well, we're really clear that part of the solution to both the climate and the nature crisis is to deliver nature-based solutions. Those are those which are establishing woodlands, for example, which uh, suck out carbon out of the atmosphere and lock it away. In a similar way, restoring our peatlands does the same. Uh, locking away uh, carbon in their in their PT soils. They also uh, support a whole range of different wildlife and provide real benefits to humans by, for example, absorbing rainwater um, uh, and letting it uh, and releasing it more slowly down the catchment, reducing flood risks. Now, during um, the intense heat waves last summer, we saw wildfires in the UK, houses bursting into flames. Is the National Trust having to now consider this when it comes to protecting your sites? Yeah, we had a number of uh, wildfires across the estate this year, and it is something that we're expecting to get um, uh, only increase. So we're managing that in a number of ways. Uh, primarily in places where we've got peat soils, which are part of the solution to the climate crisis. We're busy re-wetting those bogs, those peatlands, because wet peatlands don't burn. In other places, we're working with our partners and the fire rescue services to make sure that we've got coordinated plans such that uh, we can respond to any incidences as uh, soon as possible. But one of the kind of really critical things about wildfire is actually recognising it's a bit of a misnomer, actually. Most wildfires are caused by people, things like disposable barbecues or even litter thrown out of the window uh, can uh, magnify the sun in the drought conditions that we had earlier this year and cause fires. And those fires cause extreme devastation, um, as you can see on the, on the screen there. Now, of, of course, you're warning today that this extreme weather is, is set to become uh, the norm. This is a global issue which requires uh, cooperation between governments. What more do you want to see happen and implemented by the UK government? So we need to see stronger and faster action, both for the climate and the nature crisis. And here at the National Trust, we're working really hard with our partners as well as government departments to try to put in place robust targets to reduce um, uh, the loss of species, for example, uh, and to allow nature to recover, because that is part of the solution for the climate and nature crisis. OK, Ben McCarthy from the National Trust, we appreciate your time. Best of luck with your work. Thanks very much. Thanks. Let's have a look at today's weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.
It'll be unsettled this week with spells of wind and rain. Southern parts will be fairly mild, wet and windy at first today, while the north will be mostly fine with chill but chilly with a patchy frost. Shetland will be wet. Rain in the south will spread across many parts this morning with brighter skies and a scattering of showers following to Ireland, but Scotland will stay mostly dry and sunny. It'll be mild generally, but it will be windy and a bit rainy too in the south. Recent rain and higher than average temperatures across the Alps have brought a significant avalanche risk, especially to the north and west, so off-piste skiing is generally not advisable. That said, Austria has some good skiing on piste, mainly at altitude. France has a good high level, has good high level snow too, I should say, and the majority of ski lifts are running there. But artificial snow is still needed on many of the lower slopes. Elsewhere, the Dolomites in Italy have some of the best snow, having avoided the recent rain, while Switzerland has good snow at altitude with nearly two metres at Sasfe. Sky News Snow Report, sponsored by snowrental.co.uk, online ski hire in Europe. And with us this morning to review the newspapers are broadcasters and journalists Thomas Copeland and Badisha Mamata. Good to see you both again. Uh, Badisha, let's kick off uh, with the article you pulled out from the Daily Star. Interesting, isn't it, that this warning from the National Trust today that, you know, extreme weather is going to become the new norm has even been picked up in the Star today. Quite strong lines. Yes, it has. And it follows on from your lovely interview with Ben McCarthy from the National Trust, who every year do a survey of uh, how the year has gone in terms of nature and wither nature and what's happening with it. Unsurprisingly, the news has not been very good for the last few years. But they're pointing out that the seemingly headline grabbing climate manifestations we've had in the last 12 months are indeed going to become the new normal. So the wet bits are dry, the dry bits are wet, the solid bits are collapsing, the bits that should be liquid are solidifying. And the survey is interesting because it reminds us of the kind of year that we've had in 2022. If you cast your mind back to January, we had a very warm and mild January. And then in February, we had flash floods and heavy rainfall. And then a crazy heat wave summer where we topped 40 degrees for the first time ever. And then the snow snap just before Christmas and now an oddly mild Christmas. And Ben McCarthy and the rest of the National Trust have pointed out all the, the micro consequences for the birds and the bees and the butterflies. And of course, uh, the climate emergency isn't just picking out National Trust properties. Unfortunately, it doesn't discriminate at all. So they're pointing out that exactly as he said, we need to engage global world governments in coming together to fight rising temperatures because as dramatic as it might be and as interesting as it is to read it on the headlines, it is not good for the planet to live through. Yeah, absolutely. Even though those tropical rainstorms and flash floods that we saw in the summer and, of course, mild months in the winter, as you say, we, we see such uh, so regularly now, uh, don't we? Um, to you, Thomas, the eye, page eight, you pulled out this story that the northeast may be the next area to get its own elected mayor. That's right. The government's announcing a £1.4 billion plan for devolution northeast of England. The headline, I suppose, is a directly elected mayor. First elections May 2024. This is one of these proposals that has great potential and, and devolution deals have been championed by Labour and the Conservatives over the last number of years, often kind of put forward as a bit of a silver bullet to every imaginable problem. A, a note of caution, I think, always against devolution for devolution's sake, coming from a place like where I am at the moment in Northern Ireland, where devolution is very dysfunctional it, the devil's in the detail and you need to look at what are the specific powers responsibilities and autonomy that these devolved uh, jurisdictions have and by the look of this article um, they don't appear to be very expansive at all it lists adult education budget control local skills improvement plans some money for local rail services some money for housing and regeneration all of that just leads to a situation where devolution and devolution settlements can become a bit of a talking shop, an extra layer of bureaucracy, a nice extra layer of jobs for politicians. The big thing that's always missing from devolution, I think, across the UK is really critical revenue raising power. That's the thing that adds in accountability. That's the thing that adds in responsibility means that politicians can't always point to central governments when they need more money, which invariably they always want and, and ask for, and actually give them some responsibility for raising it as well. So, you know, this is one of a problem that you see, I think, in devolution across the entirety of the UK. If 
we want to do devolution right, we need to buy into it. We need to give proper powers um, and responsibilities. This halfway house system doesn't really work. So we'll see in 2024 and onwards as more of these deals start to come through how effective they are. But that, that would be my major concern. OK, interesting stuff, Thomas. Thank you. Um, Badisha, The Guardian, interesting story you pulled out. Former Spice Girl Mel C has cancelled her New Year's Eve performance in Poland. Why is that? I'm smiling because Mel C is my fave, but this is actually a very, very uh, serious story. Mel C, Melanie Chisholm of the Spice Girls, had been set to do a New Year's Eve performance for Polish state TV. She's now pulled out of it, saying that matters have been brought to her attention because of certain issues, which she doesn't clarify, which she says don't quite align with her values and her beliefs. Reading between the lines, her fans have said that this is, in fact, because of the Polish state, uh, the government's uh, attitude towards uh, LGBT rights. Uh, it's not illegal to be gay in Poland, but there is no recognition of same-sex marriage or civil unions, and it is not legal for same-sex couples to adopt if they want to start a family and have kids. They are not allowed to do that. And in fact, Poland ranks very low on the EU list of what it's like to be gay, uh, have gay rights, and to not be discriminated against in daily life, in work, in life, in family, in terms of values. However, Polish State TV has fought back, and one of the journalists from, from this broadcaster has now tweeted out a video of Mel C uh, performing for Russia in 2018 uh, with a slightly snarky note saying, uh, well, you know, perhaps Russia aligns with your values. And there's been a statement put out saying that, in fact, Mel C has had to cave into online comments. So it's a very interesting story about stated values uh, a state's stated values. So, of course, this doesn't mean that you have to boycott your Polish friends who are very pro-LGBTQ plus rights, but it's about what does the government represent. And this whole argument around cancellation and should it be, could it be that a major artist is having to live in fear of what's going to be said in terms of their optics, or should they just be allowed to get on with it and sort of be a pop star without being touched by socio-political issues. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And of course, uh, sports personalities uh, suffered uh, the same uh, issues in Qatar recently with the World Cup. Nevertheless, girl power from Mel C there. Uh, Let's end on something a bit lighter, shall we, Thomas? Uh, this lovely article that you pulled out from The Times, a 74-year-old retired teacher who failed his 11 plus has just graduated from university. Tell us more. I love stories like this. They pop up occasionally. So this is a 74-year-old man from Swansea. His name's John Wilshire. He's graduated with a master's degree in environmental dynamics and climate change at Swansea University at the age of 74. Failed as 11 plus, managed to get back on his feet. He, he trained as a teacher, then did a while study, while, while uh, working as a teacher, did a, a, a degree at the Open University, three diplomas. Uh, there's a great line where he says his last exam was in 1987. And he said, quote, surprisingly, some things have changed since then. <laughs> Thomas, Badisha, that is a lovely story. Thanks so much uh, for ending on that. We'll see you again next hour. Thanks very much. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, we'll have all the latest on that uh, shocking stabbing in Birmingham on Boxing Day. Family and friends pay tribute to 23-year-old Cody Fisher, who's been named as the victim of that attack in a Birmingham nightclub. We will be live in Birmingham at the top of the hour with the latest on this story uh, of that attack on Boxing Day, of course, following that other shooting, uh, that shocking attack in, in Merseyside on Christmas Eve. We'll have the latest on both. <laughs>